on September 11th, I was asleep and I got a call saying that uh, the World Trade Center is gone. And I thought, I, you know, all right, great. Because the World Trade Center, it's like when you think about it back then, it's kind of like exactly the same thing they said of the Titanic. It was unsinkable. So the Titanic, nothing was going to happen to that. It would always be there. It was this enormous ship, total, and that's what they called it, unsinkable. And the World Trade Center was like that. It was like you couldn't do anything. Uh, it looked like one of those places like armies could attack, and maybe you'd get like some uh, like broken glass here or there. And then I heard like a plane crashed into it. So it's like, okay, some uh, idiot with a single engine plane crashes. They're going to have to take a week or so to redo the windows. And then I noticed I turned on my TV and got just static. And it was, uh, I could just hear words uh, every now and then through the thing. And then other people were calling me, and it was like, after a while, they, they said that it was like a full plane that crashed into it, a real, and then another. And then it's like everyone started getting it like in little pieces that uh, what had happened. And then it was still that thing of like, no, no, they, they the World Trade Center can't be gone. That's like, uh, it's totally, there's no way to tear that building down. Uh, yeah, it happened so quick. That's the other thing. It uh, just boom, boom, gone. Uh, yeah, with the World Trade Center, it was one of those places where, like, if you go, uh, yeah, if you're walking through the city and you get those confused uh, spots where you go, uh, am I looking west or east or uptown or downtown? That was one of those. You could look there and go, oh, okay. It was also... And this I've never gotten over, and that was when I fly out of town and I come back to the city and I look out the window, I'm still looking for the World Trade Center. That was the first thing you saw from miles away coming into, uh, and, it's, and now I look and I go, there's something missing from here. This isn't... Uh, there, there used to be a commercial for Channel 11. And in Channel 11, uh, the running thing was a guy going, we need an ad campaign, something that looks like a giant 11. And you'd constantly see the World Trade Center behind him. And he'd keep like going, oh, I got to keep working on this. And uh, that was... That, that was uh, there, there was also... I remember before it happened, there was a trailer for Spider-Man. And in the Spider-Man trailer, you see, like, uh, these criminals escaping on a small plane. Spider-Man is going after them. And then all of a sudden, uh, their plane stops in midair. And then the camera pulls back, and you see, like, spider webs around the plane and then it goes further and further and you see the spider it's a gigantic web in between the world trade center and uh which was an amazing trailer i'm not interested in superheroes but i wanted to see it after that uh yeah they they pull the trailer it was uh yeah, and, and they won't even show it in, I heard, like, on the DVD. They won't even show it as an extra. There was a show I did that there was, there used to be a show on cable called Son of the Beach that was produced by Howard Stern that was a takeoff on Baywatch. Like, because, you know, Baywatch is such a serious drama, you need something as a takeoff to kind of lighten the mood of Baywatch. But uh, the first episode I did was way before September 11th, and it was uh, an attack 
by a terrorist uh, who was the brother of Osama bin Laden. Now, Osama bin Laden was not a common known name at that time. If you knew politics, you knew Osama bin Laden. And this was his, his brother, Osama bin Laden, and it was like a whole takeoff on the Jerry Lewis thing. And like, he was uh, Osama bin Laden, and the other was Osama bin Laden. And it was <laughs> that Osama bin Laden uh, was going to bomb uh, the, the beach. And it was like going to be this. T and it's like, you know, if that were a drama, we'd be studying it to this day. Uh, saying, how were they so perceptive? And uh, this was, but this was something with just, uh, you know, like girls with gigantic breasts. <laughs> and so you don't take it as seriously with those sound of enlightened. Uh, I remember like King Kong, it was used for like the, the really horrible Dino De Laurentiis King Kong. And, uh, but... Uh, they had him climb to the top of the World Trade Center and jump from one tower to the next. Um, there were some... Uh, when, when I was on Hollywood Squares, not, not that long before it happened, uh, Hollywood Squares came to New, was coming to New York to shoot some episodes... And they filmed me on top of the World Trade Center. And they, I was doing like a whole bunch of plugs for, you know, that Hollywood Squares would be coming up and other segments to show during the show. So we shot at the top of the World Trade Center. Yeah, I, well, I did, I shot a Hollywood Squares up there. I think we did a USA Up All Night up there. And it was like, it was one of those, if you are, you had to be the right day, just like the uh, Empire State Building. This is the right day. And um, it had to be the right day, but, you know, it was an amazing thing. You just felt like you're looking at the entire world from up there. After September 11th happened, there was like, uh, it was like people were never going to laugh again, it seemed like. And with my act, they haven't started yet. They're still kind of waiting. I think it just shows what a tragedy it was that people still look at me stone-faced. Um, but after it happened, it was like nobody really knew how to react to that, especially in New York, where it was like uh, the sky was like black with smoke. And it's like, and it smelled funny for, and this went on for a few days, I maybe a few weeks. It seemed like forever, maybe months. It was like there was dark smoke and a bad smell in the air. And I remember coming down in an elevator in my building, and there was just some man standing there. And we both, neither one of us said anything. We both looked at each other and went like just, like, I know. Like, we didn't make a face. It was just like, and then went back to looking down at the floor. And it was so, when, uh, with September 11th, it was weird, because show business gets a weird feeling anyway. They were going to have the Emmys, and then there was talk about having the Emmys canceled. And uh, out of deference to September 11th, I basically think they got together and said afterwards, now nah, there's too much money to be lost not having the Emmys. So then the next thought was have them dressed down. Uh, like if uh, Shannon Dougherty came there in a black pantsuit, it would make the September 11th so much happier. <laughs> and so they were going to have the Hugh Hefner roast, and I think they had postponed it, the Friars Hugh Hefner roast in New York and there was I think they postponed it once and there were a lot of people who didn't show up when it finally was rescheduled because people were terrified to fly at that time 
and I got up to the roast, and I, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't, I can't explain my personality, but I usually like to be the first one with like a really bad taste joke. And I really, I don't know. I guess I wanted to shock people out of it. Just boom, you know, it's like, because everyone was walking around like zombies. I, I mean, I don't really know what my thought is. Maybe I'm just an idiot. But um, I, you know, at any, whenever there's a tragedy, there's usually about four or five jokes that come out immediately. Before the internet, this would happen. I mean, there would be like with the space shuttle and all those, it's like they come out immediately and the entire world knew about it way before the internet, which always amazed me. So I thought I got to be the first one. So I got up at the uh, roast for you, Hefner, and I said, well, I have to leave early tonight. I have to catch a flight to L.A., uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get a direct flight. We have to make a stop at the Empire State Building. Well, this got, like, the loudest gasps and boos. And people were like, you could hear silverware and glasses dropping. The loudest grumbling, angry grumbling, shot grumbling, people not knowing what to do. Uh, booing, one guy yelled out, too soon. He just screamed out, too soon, which I took as I didn't take a long enough pause between the setup and the punchline. And I thought I should have went, one, two, three, uh, Empire State Building, and then it would have worked better. And so then there's like, I'm here, and it's like, it's one of those moments that feels like it's like, 200 years, if, if you told me like 200 years passed after I said that joke to what happened next, I would believe it because that's what it felt like. See, people to this day ask me what went through my mind after I said the joke and completely lost the audience, it, it, to say the least. I mean, this was hatred and shock and everything. I still am not positive. Like, people watch that, and I think they, they come up with ideas better than I even remember it. Like, they, they seem to look at it, and they, they're saying, well, he's thinking this, he's thinking that. I'm not quite sure. I knew I was in major trouble up there, to, and that also, to say the least. And then the odd part about it is, then with, you know, as bad taste as I could go, it's almost like I felt like, well, let me just go into the bottom level of hell and, and just be even more, you know, like uh, offensive to the nth degree. Like, like it would make the World Trade Center joke look like nothing. And I went into the joke the aristocrats. And then the audience, first they start laughing, and then it's like explosive laughter. And and there's people cheering. Uh, Rob Snyder fell off his chair. It's like everybody, I mean like the whole uh, dais of comics were cracking up, pounding on the table. The audience was screaming howling with laughter and standing up and applauding. And when it finally got to the end, there were like, you know, just screams and, and applause. And it was almost as if they needed something. They needed something that could take them out of that because they were all walking around with like a million pound weight on them. And it's like with this... And what makes me laugh about it is, like, you can never tell with audiences what they'll be offended by and what's okay. They were completely shocked and offended by my September 11th joke, but the aristocrats, which is a joke about incest and bestiality, then it's like, oh, well, that's, that's fine. 
That's that's okay. That's acceptable comedy. Filthiest joke ever. Yes, filthiest joke ever. And it really was like, uh, without giving myself too much credit, I'll let other people do that, but without, without giving myself too much credit, it was like lifted, like, it seemed like they had this tremendous weight lifted off them or like like a cage that they were in was opened up and they could all come out now and it was okay. And, uh, and it's like that type of comedy always, you know, since the beginning of time, there's been, I'm, you know, I, I always say this, it's like, I'm sure that when Christ was on the cross, among the people, there were people who were doing jokes to each other. And in all fairness to them, he wasn't really Christ at the time. He became Christ later, but that we can argue about. But that type of, of comedy, it, it seems to free people, and it seems needed. It's like, you know, go to any funeral preferably one you've been invited to, go to any funeral. Don't just show up at someone else's funeral. It's going to look bad. But go to any funeral, and I swear, aside from the people speaking up at the podium who are always telling funny stories, funny, embarrassing stories about the person lying in the box there, uh, there are other people either around the grave or like uh, sitting there uh, watching the people speak who are like leaning over to each other and uncomfortably saying something funny and the other person's like that. They're all going like, because they know they're not supposed to. Like, oh, don't, don't, don't. And they all both start laughing because it's one of those, you're not supposed to. It's a human thing. Yeah, it, it's perfectly natural. It's a human thing that... Uh, like comedy and tragedy are like, it's strange for me when they say like, oh, well, like how could you do comedy in this tragic situation? Well, it's because comedy and tragedy are just very strange roommates. They're very uncomfortable roommates. They live together and, uh, don't always get along. There's no reason for the two of them to be living together, but they just do. And so if there's tragedy, it will be followed by comedy. It always will be. And, um, you know, like, it always gets me like when they say like, tragedy plus time equals comedy. Because, uh, I always think, number one, what office is the guy in charge sitting at going, okay, we've had enough time, now we can make a joke? Like, why is it okay to make uh, Titanic jokes? It's almost be become part of our conversation. It's like, if you had a bad date, bad job, anything that went bad, you go, ah, oh, that was like the Titanic, and everyone laughs. And you go, well, so it's okay now? Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the show? Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's the other one. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the show? And there were so many. It's like, you know, during the world, uh, not during the world trade, during the uh, space shuttle, it was, it was funny because they had two tragedies in one. There was also like, people dying from uh, poison Tylenol capsules. And so the joke then was uh, uh, Tylenol and the space shuttle. This is a bad year for capsules. And uh, so th th it's always there. It will always be there. You know, when like people say, you know, is it in, in uh, duty to the public, uh, I don't really know because I, I feel like there, there are so many things where I feel like I'm perfectly okay if someone says it about me, but I can't say it about myself. Like, like 
I'm not going to go out on camera and go, I'm great. But if someone else says I'm great, I'm not going. I'm certainly not going to shut them up. Uh, with the aristocrats, it's funny. Uh, Penn Jillette from Penn and Teller asked me to take part in it, and like just to speak. And there's like one segment I do there, and. You know, I, I was not at all interested, really, because I thought this is going to be seen maybe in his living room. It's not going to go any further than that. This makes no sense whatsoever. And uh, But he convinced me to take part in it, and, and for free, which makes it his greatest magic trick. And... Uh, then when I saw that it came out to theaters and did so well, I felt uh, what happened to me was what happened to the family in that joke uh, when I was getting no money. And, um, but, yeah, so, and, and so they centered a lot around uh, my, my segment uh, at, at the U Hefner Roast. And I, I was I was very surprised by that, cause um, I mean I knew that was like a big thing, and uh, they so he he wanted to have that included, and then you know I mean it was like I was of course like you know one of those great moments of my career, like I have certain like about three that I can pick as great moments. And the rest is, this, this yeah, yeah, this is the other one, doing this thing, which I got a sandwich out of, <laughs> so it's okay. This is an important show. I got a sandwich, and I think a soda. Uh, but when I picked, like, those, I, I remember, like, sitting in the audience watching it where I was, like, became the star of the Aristocrats movie, and it was, like, a heroic, you know, I had other comics and writers talking about me and how important this was at the U Hefner roast. And I also remember getting those reviews that would be rave reviews saying, and out of all the comics, Gilbert Gottfried is certainly the most disgusting of all. And it was like a compliment. <laughs> Where they say Gilbert Gottfried is the most tasteless and disgusting of anyone in that film. And I thought, I'm like very touched now. If you watch me at all, if anyone's watched me at all on TV, it's or any at like clubs, you, you know that like me doing something shocking or bad taste is not like, like a news story. Like with the... Uh, my jokes about the tsunami, it became a news story. And it's kind of like I always think of that scene, the classic scene from Casablanca, uh, where Claude Rains is in Humphrey Bogart's casino, and he goes, he decides to shut it down, and they say, why? And he goes, I'm shocked, shocked to find gambling going on. And that's what it was like during that whole tsunami situation. It was like, it to me, it was like I was just doing what I always do. It's like if you, to me, it was like eating cornflakes for breakfast every single day. Then one day you eat cornflakes and all hell breaks loose. And now you, uh, now all of a sudden you have to explain uh, to people uh, the news media went absolutely insane with it, as they always do. And the first thing that they did was change it from Gilbert Gottfried's jokes to Gilbert Gottfried's comments, remarks, and statements. Because when you say jokes, people go, all right, jokes. And they go, well, yeah, but these were really mean and hateful. And they, people still go, well, yeah, but they were jokes. And um, see, and that's the thing. It's like uh, these type of jokes were always around. They've been around since the beginning of time. 
They'll be around when, when all of the human race is wiped out. The one last person left standing before he dies is most likely going to make some sarcastic remark over what he just saw. There have been the jokes about, you know, you know, uh, besides that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? Uh, when the space shuttle blew up, it was also around the same time the people died of poison Tylenol capsules. So they said, the space shuttle and Tylenol, it's a bad year for capsules. They say tragedy plus time equals comedy. I always say, who decides that? Who says, well, okay, we've looked at the computer, added it up, now we can do a joke. What what always, uh, what gets me, it's like when Michael Jackson was alive, uh, it was perfectly okay to do jokes about pedophiles and child molestation. That's what the majority of those jokes were. And it's like, if I were to do a joke saying, hey, this pedophile uh, is bringing a kid onto his van at a shopping mall, I mean, no way I could get away with that. But when you said, hey, Michael Jackson was driving his van and pulling a kid on it, then it was like, oh, well, that's okay. And it's like, how do people, you know, separate those two? And now everyone does Casey Anthony jokes, and that's okay. Um, what's funny to me is when people say to me, like, how, how could you do jokes like this? Don't you understand what's going on? Do you know what's going on there? And I always go, yeah, I do know what's going on, and that's where these jokes come from. If I didn't know what was going on, I wouldn't be doing these jokes. And they always, like, they always say, like, uh, how could you, like, make jokes about this horrible, tragic situation. And to me, it's like, it's a weird thing, but uh, comedy and tragedy are two very strange roommates. They live together. You don't know why they live together. They seem so different from each other that they, they never seem to get along with each other, but they live together. And if tragedy is around, comedy is right behind them. And it will always be like that. During the Howard Stern show, uh, he was like, uh, on September 11th, you know, he was talking typical Howard Stern stuff. And I think it was that someone said he and Pam Anderson were kissing and uh, everyone was coming in, arguing back and forth did he have sex with Pam Anderson? And then it got broken with some news that a plane crashed into the World Trade Center and no one knew anything about it. So it was like, eh, you know, also like, like I thought, like the world thought, some schmuck in a little plane crashed. And so they said, you know, made some remarks about it and then there's nothing. And then they immediately went back to talking about whether or not Howard Stern had sex with Pam Anderson and did they kiss and what the kiss was like and was he aroused when he was kissing her and all that stuff. And then they get another report that sounds like a little deeper and it was funny because on the Stern show it was like people in real life. It was trickling in tiny pieces. Like it wasn't like, uh, you know, both World Trade, the World Trade Center went gone, the World Trade Center went down, both towers are gone, terrorist attack. Now we know that. Back then it was like, what? You know, and it was like, and you could hear it on the Stern Show trickling in, that it would be more and more information each time. And then eventually he stops going back to the trivial and the sexual stuff he's talking about, and then it it was weird. It was like Howard Stern became a new show. 
for that for that day. They were actually trying to find out and reporting. It was like people. They were like, it wasn't a, a news thing. There's something with the news, I've certainly experienced this through my career, is like the news grabs something and the news is show business. You know, there's no way to escape it. And the anchor people and reporters are the greatest actors in the world. They try to pound the story out and they try to act like they themselves are crying over it and are outraged and everything. And with Howard Stern, it was just like, you know, it was a more clumsy thing. People sitting around. It was just like anybody in the street uh, sitting around talking. And it was like uh, not that prepared news stuff. The news, when there's a, a big tragedy or disaster, immediately they've got a logo on the news. I don't know, like, how they put it together. It's in color and it's dramatic. They've got, like, a title for it. They've got everything prepared. And on Stern and, like, other things like that, people were just thrown and just talking. They were just like people in shock. Howard Stern came back the next morning and went to work, and that was it. And he, like, basically let you know, hey, I'm back. You know, I'm not going to be knocked down by it. There was, this, this I remember too, there was an episode of Penn and Teller show Bullshit where they, they brought up my uh, joke during September 11th and they said, uh, Penn goes, Gilbert was just doing what he does. He was doing comedy. It was business as usual. And it was like the most important thing to tell the world is business as usual. And their recommendation at the end when they were coming up with ideas of what to put in that place is they showed like a, a mock thing of the World Trade Center and they said, how about this to tell the entire world business as fucking usual? And uh, that, I, that, that was something that was very important. And that was really like the most important thing you could do is say that like, no, we're just going to go on. We're going to go on. We're going to laugh about it. We're going to build something there. And we don't care. You know, you won that battle, but you didn't win the war.